Our first reading is a reading from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Our second reading is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your lifespan? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Well, again, a warm, warm welcome to all of you, a special welcome to our guests and newcomers, and a special welcome to our Scout families and Scout Masters. We're so glad you're here, grateful to all of you uh, for the Scout troops we have here, both girl and boy, and then then the Cub Scout troops and Weevilos and all the things. Uh, Let's just give a shout of amen, amen, and grateful for those folks. Uh, We welcome all of you today as we uh, celebrate Thanksgiving Sunday and the life of the church, and many of you will gather on Thursday, maybe Friday, and have meals together with friends or family, and uh, we know that'll be an important time, and we wish you a blessed Thanksgiving. Today we come together as church family, giving thanks and uh, celebrating this uh, national holiday together, but we really should be thankful every day, amen? And so over these past four weeks, we have been exploring uh, creating a life and attitude of gratitude, being thankful on a daily basis, which helps ground us in our faith in Jesus Christ. So we've looked at lots of ways to be thankful. We've been thankful for friends and family. We've been uh, thankful for the way God has blessed us. Last week, uh, we heard sometimes how it's hard to uh, be thankful. But over these last weeks, we've done a lot of giving thanks. Amen? And there's a board out, a bulletin board. People have been writing words of thanksgiving. I encourage you to do that today because we'll be praying over those this week. Wonderful opportunities for us to give thanks. And in fact, we live in a culture that doesn't give thanks very often. Amen? It's a culture quick to criticize, a culture quick to attack, a culture quick to complain. And yet, Jesus calls us to be a people of gratitude. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day. When we get into the heart of winter, help us to remember today. To be grateful for the sun and the warmth and the gift of scouts who are learning more about you and for beautiful music and Uh, bells ringing, and all of this beauty and gratitude and abundance. For it, we're grateful. God, we live in a culture quick to criticize, quick to be difficult, quick to be hard, and you call us to a place of thanksgiving. So we pray, God, that our hearts will be grateful, that we'll see your blessings each day in our lives, and that we'll move from a place of worry and anxiety into a grounded place of trusting and seeing you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have a degree in education, and I have a degree in history, but my best and most intentional and amazing 
degree that I have is the degree in uh, worry, right? Okay, right? Anybody have that degree, right? Yeah, I've, I've done graduate work, PhD work. I am an excellent worrier, right? I grew up in a family of worriers. Anybody, right? You know, uh, my maternal grandmother worried all the time. She worried about her nine children. Then, if that wasn't enough, she had 35 grandchildren, and she worried about them. And every time you called her, she was worried about something about you or about one of your cousins, right? And when we would gather, uh, all nine of the children, their spouses, the 35 grandchildren, and some of their spouses and kids, it was a huge group. And all my grandmother did was worry that there would be enough food, right, and enough places to sleep. And I remember one time saying to her, Grandma, can't you just relax and enjoy all of us here? But she could not. And I, I'm sorry for her, you know, because she missed some opportunities. There were moments that she could have relished the family gathered, but she was so worried. I wish I could say my mother broke the chain, but she didn't. She actually strengthened it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so my mother didn't have that many children. She only had three, but she had enough worry for the three plus, right? I mean, my mom was one of those folks that when we went out uh, to go out when we were in high school, we had to call on a regular basis, like every hour or two, right? And that was pre-cell phone, right? So pre-cell phone, you had to have a thing called a quarter, and you had to use a thing called a pay phone. If you've never seen a pay phone, there's one in the entryway. We hide it, but it's a historical moment, so you can sneak back there and see it. I just remember having to carry a pocket full of quarters to say, we're going here, we're doing this, I'm on my way home, right? It's a lot, right? And then what do you think happened? I carried that worry myself. So I worry about all kinds of things, and I worry about my health, and I worry about my friends, and I worry about my family, and I can really get churned up. I wake up at 2 in the morning, and lately I've been worried about this trench out here, right? I dream about this trench. I live in this trench. I walk that trench because I want it to be gone, right? I, I drove up today and said, oh, that trench, right? And then it just cranked me up, right? Now, I know you're all better than that, amen, but some of us in the room struggle with worry. A few of us don't. Praise the Lord. We'd love to talk to you, amen? So what does it mean to be anxious and to allow worry to dominate our lives? It's interesting. I've been doing a little reading on anxiety and worry. It's interesting a recent study at the end of 2017 noted that worry and anxiety are on the upswing. Would you believe that? Amen? Amen, right? In fact, it is on a radical upswing. In fact, the number of anxiety disorders and people on medication for anxiety and people that are struggling with anxiety and worry has increased manyfold, right? And in fact, when they did the study of all five continents uh, and kind of paying attention to where the anxiety levels are high, it's interesting that North America has the highest level of anxiety than anyone else in the world. We live in a culture of anxiety. We live in a culture of competition. We live in a culture and a, a culture of social media that can devastate people with just a few words posted. Amen, right? We can tweet and post and hurt people and create things that create even more anxiety. And because things are so, so anxious, it just brings more anxiety. And maybe right now you're already anxious, right? Maybe I've even made you more anxious, right? So then I think about how do we live with anxiety? And certainly medication can be important, and it's, it, you need to do it. And therapy is a wonderful way to do that. I see a therapist once a week. That's good for you. Amen, right? But why are we in a culture of anxiety? It's interesting that many people believe the solution, or one of the solutions to worry and anxiety is gratitude. Taking time to see what you have and how you've been blessed to kind of relieve the anxiety to see that indeed God is providing. So what does Jesus have to say about worry? Well, he has quite a bit to say about worry. And if you have your Bible, you can follow along with me in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. So it's interesting where this text about worry falls. It falls after Jesus' teaching around possessions. Oh, wow. Maybe that's part of the problem here, right? Maybe we begin to get so many things that we have to care for, or we're afraid we don't have the latest, you know? I mean, you know how it is with your cell phone. You buy it, and a week later you get an email that it's already out of date, right? 
I mean, we used to have things called desktop computers. They don't even exist, or if they do, they're ancient, right? And, and we're always, or I'm always wondering, uh, do I have the right phone? Do I have enough apps? You know, it's just crazy, right? And then if you have a cell phone, it dings, right? Am I missing something? Which creates anxiety, too. So it's interesting that prior to this day, Jesus talks about you cannot serve God and possessions at the same time. Wow. You feeling uncomfortable? I hope you are. Amen, right? So then out of that conversation around things, Jesus says this. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body or what you'll wear. Now, do you hear that? Let me say, read it again in the context of our culture, right? How many of you received so many ads today in your email, right? How many of you, in reading the paper, if you read the paper, saw tons of ads? How many of you get that thing of multiple pages that you don't ask for? I don't know what it's called, but it's a shopper, and it just... It just keeps building up, right? You know, Bed Bath & Beyond, how many coupons can they produce, right? (laughs) Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body or what you'll wear. Hmm. I'm convicted. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? And then Jesus says this, look at the birds in the sky, don't they sow seed or They don't sow seed, they don't harvest grain, they don't gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? That's an important word, right? Do you realize actually worrying and anxiety take away from your lifespan? We know that uh, medicine has already proven that high levels of anxiety and stress take its toll on us physically. To worry means to shorten our life, right? And so it's an interesting thing that he lifts up birds of the air, that they're cared for, that God takes care of them. So if God's taking care of a sparrow, surely God is taking care of you. And then he goes on, who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? Anybody worry about their clothes? Or maybe you can sub in something else. Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work and they don't spend cloth. But I say to you that King Solomon in all his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. Again, he lists up another simple thing, lilies of the field, flowers. They're so beautiful. And if God's caring for the flowers, God's caring for us, and God doesn't really care what we wear, right? We worry a lot about little things. And maybe it's not clothes or food, but maybe it's something, and you can name it in your heart. Now, what's interesting is this doesn't say we just kind of sit around and let God take care of us, right? So in the early church, some people thought that. They said, well, I don't have to work anymore. God's going to provide. We have a reason. But when we become anxious and worried and focus so much that we can't be grateful, we miss the boat. Then he goes on to say uh, these beautiful words. Uh, Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? Do we have the latest cell phone? I added that. (laughs) Gentiles long for all these things. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Now, what's interesting is the Greek word for worry in the New Testament, the Greek word for worry in the New Testament comes from a a word that means split or divided attention. Isn't that interesting? That to worry means that we divide our attention between what's important and what's trivial. When we worry, we're not focused fully on God's provision in our life. When we worry, our attention is divided. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has its own trouble. And I just love those words. They're good words for me, and I I read this passage frequently, that to be grateful people, to be people who give thanks, that, that we do not worry, and we certainly don't worry about what's to come. And that, that's another sin that we fall into, right? I call it borrowed worry. Anybody do that? You know what I'm saying? So you're worried about something, then you begin to imagine the worst possible scenario, then by, by Saturday you've worked out a whole month of what's going to go wrong. Anybody do that? I borrow lots of trouble. In fact, I borrow trouble that's not even existent, right? I I think this is going to happen, and, oh, I bet they're mad at me, and then this is going to happen, and then before I know it, I'm ready to throw up. You know what I'm saying, right? Anybody out there, right? But what would it mean if we didn't worry about tomorrow? Today's enough, right? What if we lived 
for today? What if we focused on today? What if we didn't rush out of here today, but we had a cup of coffee and visited with someone today? What if we took time to tell those four scouts, good job, because it's not that important that we get to the game, right? Right? They're not going to win anyway, right? <laughs> I'm not even going to worry about it, right? And you probably shouldn't either. <laughs> what would it mean if we were people of gratitude? I was in a retreat just a few weeks ago here in Buffalo Grove, and it was a retreat about gratitude and about Thanksgiving. And we talked a lot about how anxiety denominates our life, and, and we talked about how worry gets in and people can set us off and, and how all that can keep us from seeing what God is doing in our lives. And one of the things, it's so simple, and I've said it before, I'll say it to you again. One of the ways to stop worrying and to reduce anxiety, and sometimes it's super hard, is to start making a list of what you're grateful for, okay? And maybe you're lying in bed and you can't sleep and you're thinking about work and you're very anxious. Maybe you just start in your head, I'm grateful for my spouse, I'm grateful for my home, I'm grateful for a place to worship. And once you start listing that out, you begin to just continue to list, Amen. Or maybe you're like me, I need to write it down, right? I need to just start writing down this list of things I'm grateful for. And, and like this morning, I was just preparing again for today, listing the things I'm grateful for. I have so much to be grateful for, right? I have food in my refrigerator. I have an apartment that I love. I have a tree that changes color outside my window. You know what? I have a television. I can watch TV and look at I Love Lucy. I mean, really, it's an amazing life, right? I have amazing friends. I have a great family. I have, all, I have challenges. We all have challenges. But once you start listing out all of the things we have, even in the midst of hard challenge, we are blessed. I'm not Pollyanna. I know there are real challenges in the world. And I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with those. But I'm just saying that sometimes we need to step back and give thanks for God's abundance and provision by making that list. So, I'm going to challenge you this week to make a list. Make a list at home, make a list at work, make a list on Wednesday. Worry less about the turkey. Cook it, we don't want salmonella, but you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Maybe it's a few less dishes. Maybe you know your aunt's going to complain about your salad and you've already worked it through, right? Call me, I'll help you, right? God has blessed us so much. Look around you today, really. You can twist your head and worship. It's amazing, right? Look across the room at all the amazing people in this space. We have so much for which to be thankful. Let us be thankful people. And together we say, amen. So I, we wish you a blessed, blessed, and sacred, and grateful Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. But as you go into this week, don't let worry take you over. Amen? Mm -hmm. But take time each day to list out all the things God is doing in our lives, all the blessings we have received. For indeed, God has done great things for us. God is doing great things for us. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.